Hey, thanks for joining us online. It's good to have you here. Hey, I'm excited. Today is a day God made, and we can rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. It's going to be good. Stewardship. We started a series. This is the third week. I want to talk to you about an area that really I think we all can struggle with. It's kind of going in our own way. It's kind of having our own ideas. You know, if I were to ask a uh, you know, for a show of hands, anybody got some ideas, anybody got some passions, anybody got some, some things they'd really like God to key in on and bless and do and, and go in. But stewardship's about us making sure that we're stewarding our life, this life that God has given us. The Bible's very specific. When you're a follower of Christ, when you're a Christian, no longer do you live, but Christ lives through you. That includes not just your physical body, that includes everything about you. Everything that we may say is our stuff, from money to to responsibilities, it's all to be steward as unto the Lord. And that, that should change how we live. And sometimes it does. And sometimes people struggle with that, even those that would say they're a Christian. And as a Christian, again, uh, my life is not my own. The Bible says we were bought with a price. That's, that's pretty specific. That's pretty dynamic for our lives. And so I want to talk to you about this idea of being essentially enticed, essentially enticed. I'll explain those words, essentially enticed. And stewardship is, is part of that in what we view as important, essential, and what we're enticed to, not just in what attracts us, but truly what powers us, uh, part of our nature. Um, stewardship is ultimately about controlling what controls us. Um, Better yet, controlling what controls us or potentially is over us. Uh, I'll explain it this way. We all have things that control us at multiple levels. We know this. Generally speaking, it could be a person. We understand uh, many of you work in an organization. Maybe you're not the boss. You have a boss. That person is in somewhat of a controlled area of your life. Uh, a goal can control us. A season, a system, political stance, policies, and mandates. Uh, controls can be light signals, uh, doorways, walls, technology, finances, masks, uh, vaccines. We understand this idea of different aspects of controls in our life. And how we steward that as unto God, how we steward that as a Christian, I think is imperative. And here's what I want you to understand. If you're taking notes, write this down. When controls are tested, when controls are tested in our lives, our value of stewardship in the essentials is revealed. I'll say it again. When controls are tested, our value of stewardship in the essentials is revealed. Now, I'm speaking from the aspect of a spiritual standpoint in our lives. I'm speaking from the aspect of spiritual, spiritual principle and, pref, and, and precedence in our lives. And here's where the battle lies. It, it, it lies in the differences in what people think is a valued essential. What someone may say is a valued essential, somebody else may not think that. What somebody thinks is, is, is a valued essential in the areas of whatever in life and family and work, uh, someone else may not have that value and that essential. But as a Christian, there is a commonality and the filter is the mind of Christ. We're talking about that today. The links people go to to exercise their stewardship over an essential. What they feel is important is telling Remember, stewardship is a form of control. That's what stewardship is. It controls what's been given to us. It controls where it goes, how it goes. We have to do it right. For example, if money is your main essential, then when it is tested in your life, uh, it reveals your trust and your mindset toward it. Some people, if, if money becomes a problem, if money becomes an issue, it, it throws them off badly. And a lot of people struggle with money because if I had more money, my life would be more stable. And that's not the case. Not, not if you're a follower of Christ and God will work through all of that. You're a steward. If time is your main essential, when that's tested, it reveals your mindset. It reveals your mindset. And if your main essential is not the things of God, you may find yourself saying the right thing at the, what you think is the right time, but your heart and your mind are off in areas of stewardship. We'll see this in a story I'll bring out in a moment, but let me give you a working definition of essential. Essential, it's something deemed absolutely necessary. It's extremely important. It's something that has to be in place. Uh, that's the working definition of an essential, and we understand from a pandemic standpoint that on the front end of the pandemic, uh, back end essentials became priority. Remember the toilet paper shortage of 2020, right? 
hand sanitizer, bleach, face masks, all these different things. Uh, Jesus was constantly trying to teach his disciples not just good lessons, but he was trying to teach them lessons that had an application that would require of them more than just an understanding. It would require of them to have his mind, the mind of Christ. To have his heart in a matter. Not to just what Jesus would do. We understand the brace, like what would Jesus do? But truly, what would Jesus think? What would Jesus think about this? Because out of what we think is what we do, and out of what we think is, is really what we believe. And Jesus was driving some lessons home to his disciples. He's speaking to them, but he's wanting them to go deeper. And we're going to pick up on this time, Matthew 16, 13 through 15. Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Speaking of himself. And they said, some say John the Baptist. Now, just that statement's pretty interesting because John the Baptist had been beheaded at that point. So if the crowd, if the buzz in the crowd is saying he's John the Baptist, they're saying something spiritual, miraculous happened, and he's really John the Baptist who's come back to life. That's maybe one of the things that the crowds were saying. They go on. They said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Now, Elijah the prophet had been dead a long time. He'd been gone a long time off the scene from the Old Testament days, and uh, he's come back. They're saying, this, this has to be Elijah. This is the guy we read about then. He has to be Elijah. That's what the crowds were saying. His, other, his disciples said, others say Jeremiah. Again, one of the prophets, one of the, uh, the main prophets in the Old Testament. And then, or one of the prophets. You're a holy man. There's, there's something special about you. That's what people are saying. But Jesus dials it in even closer as often he does, and he will with you, just like he did with his closest followers. He said to them, but who do you? say that I am. Yeah, I hear what the crowds are saying, and wow, that's pretty out there, and, and, and maybe that could be a compliment, because these were great men, and, and they think I'm a great man, but he was more than that. Who do you say that I am? Jesus has a way of getting down to not just what we say, but what we truly believe. Uh, a lot of people say one thing and do another. Uh, Jesus is addressing that issue, and what we believe about Jesus and his mission is essential. Because if you don't view, if you don't think about Jesus and his mission the way Jesus thinks about it, you're going to be off in many areas, if not all areas of your life. And Jesus knew this, and his closest disciples, he's trying to get this truth into them. And church, that hasn't changed. That truth hasn't changed. What we believe about Jesus is, is essential, and it must have the correct stewardship biblically, spiritually. See, essentials ultimately come down to what entices us or draws us or tempts us, which are ultimately associated with our comfort. See, we're drawn to those things that are most comfortable. I mean, that's our lives. You know, if I were to turn the heat up in here, like to 95, I mean, there might be a handful of you go, oh, that would be great because I'm freezing to death. Uh, but there would be a lot of mad people. If we turned it down to 32, there might be a handful of you going, finally, crystals in the air. This is great. <laughs> but there would be some mad people. It's too cold. We're kind of drawn to our comforts. We're drawn to what makes us most comfortable. And, and in that, oftentimes, there's a crossroads or there's, there's a uh, crisis that happens because God doesn't always lead us that way, right? Well, this is one of those, those understandings. And Jesus, uh, he has this mindset of what's essential. He has this understanding of what draws us, what entices us. And just like when the controls of our lives are tested, our stewardship of the essentials is revealed. Write this down. When our comforts are tested, our enticements are triggered. Our enticements are triggered. When our comforts are tested, our enticements are triggered. What draws us? It, it reveals it reveals our nature in a situation. You ever have somebody say something to you like, uh, they say, hey, this happened to me. And you're like, well, if that happened to me, I would have. Uh, what's happening? Something triggered in them. What entices them to go to force, to power, to, to correction, to justice? Uh, when our comforts are tested, our enticements are triggered. And Jesus' message, his, his path and, and ways will always take us past our comfort zone. Always. Well, I want to follow Jesus as long as it's comfortable. Then you'll never follow Jesus. Jesus is always going to take you past your comfort zone. And, and what he does in that is he causes the opportunity to have total faith in him. Amen? Total faith in him. And it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to live it. 
That's where he's dialing in his disciples. Okay, everybody's saying this. They're saying all these things and, you know, hey, it's powerful. They, they realize something spiritual is happening. But what do you say? I mean, it's imperative. What do you say? Well, Jesus is Lord of my life. Do you follow him by faith? Well, I try to. Uh, do you follow him no matter what? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'll follow Jesus as long as I agree. Well, nobody maybe says that. Maybe you do say that. <laughs> I'll follow Jesus as long as it's comfortable. I'll follow Jesus as long. Jesus had this problem in his original disciples at church. He has this problem in his disciples nowadays. We got to look at this. This is where faith in him controls our stewardship. Everything about us is to be steward according to to his plan, his purpose, his mindset. Well, in response to Jesus' question, but who do you say I am? Matthew 16, 16 through 17, it says Simon Peter. He speaks up. He's the one that always speaks up. He kind of has that problem, puts his foot in his mouth. We, uh, some of us relate with him better than others. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What a powerful statement. As you'll see in a minute, I mean, this was, this was a blessed statement. I know everybody else is saying, maybe John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, maybe one of the prophets. Well, who do you say I am? I say you're, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah is what he's saying. You're the Savior of the world. You're that one. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. This meaning uh, Simon, um, uh, son of Jonah, not Jonah and the whale. Uh, Jonah, his dad. It says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Uh, this statement, what he said was, uh, it was something God planted in your heart. You, you took hold of this, and, and what you say is true. What you say is right. My Father gave you that. Jesus given Peter an essential precedent of stewardship here. You may not think of it that way, but it truly is. In other words, Peter, what you said was true, but don't miss the stewardship and the principle of the spiritual application here. Again, enticements. What draws us, what reveals, what we're tempted to go towards uh, are triggered when our comforts are tested. Jesus is getting ready to test Peter's comfort. <laughs> He's getting ready to test his statement. See, the power of an enticement has drawn many to their demise. Any mouse understands the enticement of cheese. Um, I like the old saying, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. You know, uh, We tell people, say cheese, and they smile. Um, Cheese is a powerful thing. Cause people to smile and cause, cause things to uh, find their demise, <laughs> you know. Uh, an enticement. What entices you? You know, speaking of spiritual enticements, the testing of our comforts, the testing of our faith. James 1, 12 through 15 says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. It means they don't fall apart. They don't throw their hands up in the air and give up. They throw their hands in the air and draw strength. Uh, it says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. He says it right here, and this is pretty plain, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. See, our own desire will lie to us every time. Our own desire will not naturally lead us to Jesus. It says, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I mean, here's the truth. Some people get really good at doing the wrong thing. Some people, by their desire, they get really good at doing the wrong thing, and sometimes they get doing the wrong thing, and they ask God to kind of bless them in it, uh, I like what Peter Drucker said. He's kind of a management guru. Uh, he, he said, nothing is less productive than to make more efficient what should not be done at all. <laughs> I think some people are trying to do things that should not be done at all. Jesus, in teaching his disciples, is dialing this in. Who do you say I am? Peter answers correctly, but there's something still lacking because the mind and the heart of Jesus is, is, is maybe not there. Uh, Matthew 16, 18 through 20, it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I mean, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty awesome. He goes, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I mean, if you're Peter, you're feeling pretty good about yourself right now. I said the right thing. <laughs> Answered that correctly. Woo! I got an A going on right now. 
Look at Jesus' words here, verse 20. Now he's saying this to Peter, but he's saying this to the other disciples. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. What? You don't want us to tell people. We've answered. Okay, Peter answered correctly. You're the Christ, the son of the living God, but now you don't want us to tell anybody about it. Why is that? Has God ever landed some information on you, ever, ever maybe opened an opportunity to you, but there, there's just kind of this stall time, there's just kind of this pause time, there's just kind of this, this moment that, well, God, let's go forward. Let's do this. Yeah, God, I, I, I feel it. And he says, not right now. And you go, what? See, if God's holding something back from you, instead of maybe rebuking him, instead of maybe uh, trying to correct him, maybe thank him. Maybe timing is of the essence. Maybe you don't have the mindset. I think this is this area. Why would Jesus tell them not to tell people who he was at that moment? Because there was a time when he was, they were, they were empowered to be witnesses and to tell the good news, but not here. I think there were still things he needed to teach them. They weren't ready. There were some things that weren't lined up. Yeah, they were followers of Jesus, but there were some things that in their mindset wasn't right yet. The right things were being said, but they still had the wrong mindset. Peter in particular, they hadn't gotten the stewardship of what was essential, what had to be there, what was part of the mind of Christ, which was the heart of Christ, which would honor the word of God. They needed to carry uh, these things they had to get because these were going to carry them through the difficult times that were ahead, and there were definitely difficult times ahead. My fear in the modern church and speaking to us right here, my fear of the modern church is that we're, we have a lot of people listening to a lot of things that may or may not matter in the grand scheme of God's will for their lives. Their mind is on earthly things. Peter had established the stewardship of speaking out truth, the right thing, but he had the wrong mindset. The Apostle Paul was talking to the Corinthians and he writes them a letter, and in 1 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16, it says the spiritual person, he instructs, judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one, no human. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as, so as to instruct him? He says, but we have the mind of Christ. He gives us this nugget of gold here of, we have the mind of Christ. So we're not judged by the world because what we do may or may not make sense and usually doesn't make sense from the world's point of view. A lot of people are going to the world to make sense of the times. Go to the word to make sense of the times. Well, I just think we should do this. Make sure you have the mind of Christ in whatever you're trying to do or, or the path you think you should take. Having the mind of Christ is critical in the aspect of stewardship in the essentials and the enticements of our lives. What draws us Two things, particularly from our nature. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Could you imagine hearing that news? I mean, all this is in a dialogue that Jesus is having with his disciples and hearing that news and going, no, that's not how I saw this playing out. I mean, think about the disciples that he had the original 12, I mean, that, what a hodgepodge group, but some of them were known as zealots, which meant they were part of resistance. They were part of take it back. They were, they were part of, Jesus, when are you going to take back the throne? When are you going to do this by force? I mean, that was their mindset. That's who Jesus chose to follow them. You talk about not having the mind of Christ because that's not how God was going, that's not how Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. Not like that, but that's what they were enticed to. That's how they would do things, but that's not how Jesus would do things. Be careful that you find yourself going, I know Jesus would probably do this, but I'm gonna, well then you're headed down the wrong path right there. Well, I think this is important. I think God thinks it's important. Have you asked him? You know, this so a difficult lesson. You're going to do what? You're going to Jerusalem? We're going to, okay, you're going to suffer? What? what? And you're going to be killed? Okay, hang on. I mean, this is a difficult lesson. This is a difficult teaching. The fact that Jesus was presenting this to his followers, 
He was establishing in them a mindset of being ready, a mindset to trust him, his mindset that the world would never understand because it does not make sense from a world standpoint. You're going to establish a kingdom, but you're going to die. That doesn't make sense. We were following you. I mean, what a buzz. What a sizzle, that message of going, I, I just, I can't understand this, Jesus. And at, sometimes you just have to go, but I trust you. And you deem that essential. And I'm enticed to do things my way. I'm enticed to do, I'm enticed to put the tool belt on and fix it. Uh, Lord, if it goes down like that, I can't fix this. I can't control this. I can't. God, are you telling me you don't want me to have controls? No, he's telling you he wants you to just be a steward of what he's placed you over, but you've got to do it through his mindset. What he deems is essential. I mean, some people surround themselves with things they cannot handle. I'm convinced of this. They're, they're overwhelmed with the stewardship of the essentials and the temptations of the enticements that surround them. Instead of praying for God to deliver them, they pray for God to strengthen them to something he never called them to. God, that cheese looks really good. Give me the strength to handle that trap when it comes down. Strengthen me, Lord. I'm trusting you in this. And God's going, I never called you to that. But it looks so good. I'm made for this, God. No, you're not. You view something as essential that God doesn't view as essential. You're enticed to something he didn't draw you to. Be careful. Some of the standards, the situations, the surroundings people have said is essential to their comfort, their happiness, their values is not in line with Scripture and faithful living as an ambassador, a representative of Jesus Christ. And what these essentials have done is that they've created weights that a person was never designed to carry as they followed God. What's essential to you? Think about it. What's essential to you spiritually? What's a, what entices you? What entices you spiritually? Those are huge questions. Somebody ever say something to you like this? Uh, you know, this happened to me and this, and, and you come back and you, and, and, and you say, well, I would have, you know, sometimes people have their own ideas, their own passions, their own direction of what they're enticed to, of how they handle a hard, a difficult, a hurtful situation. Um, that may not be how God would handle that. Be careful. Without the mind of Christ, you may find yourself fighting the things of God and not even realizing it. Peter did. Jesus has unloaded all this information. We're going to go to Jerusalem. The Pharisees, the scribes, there's going to be a religious war on me. They're going to hate me. They're going to want to kill me. And actually, ultimately, guys, they're going to kill me. But I'm going to rise from the dead. Uh, Peter, his enticement to fury, his enticement to control, his enticement to power, to, to fight, comes out. Matthew 16, 22 through 23, it says, in, in response to this, it says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Going to take Jesus to the side and rebuke him. Yeah, I hear what you said, Lord. Here, I, just, I, I don't want to say this in front of everybody, so I, you know this is going to be honoring and respectful. I'm going to take you to the side, and, uh, and, and here, Lord... Uh, yeah, uh, I need to correct you. I think you're saying some things, and I kind of get the gist of what you're saying, but here I'm going to tell you how to say it better. I'm going to, I think what you meant was, I heard what you said, but I think what you meant, maybe you need to say it. I mean, this is kind of the dynamic here. And Jesus was real impressed. Here's what Peter said to him. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. In other words, I mean, again, Peter is notorious for saying the right thing, in his own mind, what he views as essential, what he sees as an enticement. Jesus, this is never going to happen. As long as I'm on the post, as long as I'm guard, nobody's going to come and get you. Yeah, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to take bullets for you. I'm going to take, they even have bullets. I'm going to take arrows for you. <laughs> I'm your guy. Never going to happen. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. That's not going to happen. No, mm-mm. Jesus, your mindset's a little bit off because my mindset's right because mine is to protect what we got here. Real impressed that Jesus says, says he turned to Peter. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He says, you're a hindrance to me. He says, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
that's deep. How easy it is for us to pivot. Yeah, but that seems like that would be the right thing. From a world standpoint, maybe so, but not from the mindset of Christ. You say, well, it just seems like we should jump in, we should fix, we should make, we should establish. If it's the mind of Christ. What's the mind of Christ? See, sometimes I think people find themselves going down a tangent because of what they've listened to, what they've allowed to influence their lives, and what they now deem as essential, and they're enticed according to their sinful nature. We're bent towards that. There's a battle for our soul, church. But we don't battle against flesh and blood, the Bible tells us, but against principalities, be, be, against strongholds. I mean, these are things that are out of our league that we need the Lord. We need his mindset. We need the spirit of God to lead and guide us in. Amen? This is what Jesus is building in these guys. You don't have your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I close with this. His presence, his power. That's essential in our lives. It's essential. His mindset is what will hold us when our controls are tested, when those boundaries, when those, when those things that cause us to have to live in the systems of the world, but we're not of this world, but when those controls are tested, this is his mindset will, will hold us. Our values are revealed and our enticements are triggered. What we're drawn to, God, no longer my way but yours. There's a breaking, there's a humbling Here's Jesus' solution for you. This is what he said to his disciples in this, in this whole dialogue. He says this, Matthew 16, 24 through 27. It says, then Jesus told his disciples. This truth for them is the truth for us. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? He says, or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. In other words, you could literally translate this. He will repay each person according to how they've stewarded the life God has given them. It's all about stewardship. To have the mind of Christ, I have to have the understanding of what he deems is essential, what he deems as worth going after. And the things of God are very different than the things of the world. Our lives they encompass a spiritual nature. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, all across this place. The stewardship of that nature, that spiritual nature, will never be found in the logic of this world, the rhetoric of this world ways of this world. It just won't. Steward what you listen to. People, podcasts, news outlets, steward what you listen to, what influences you, what you allow to guide your life. Steward that. It'll mess you up. Who are you listening to and where are you establishing your essentials? We understand heaven and earth is going to pass away. We understand that. We also understand that the Lord is coming. We understand that we have a blessed hope. He's coming again. That this life that we live is not the end all. I mean, truly, the best is yet to come. But until then, we don't live according to our will. We live according to his as followers of Christ. And in that, we find hope. We, find, we have a blessed future, amen? Stir what you listen to. Because the world... You know, sometimes the scripture says that in the end times, mark of the end times, that people will draw a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I, we oftentimes interpret that as just non-believers. And they're going to formulate some gospel, uh, some message. And that may be part of that. I think that includes believers. You know, I would deem the disciples as believers, but they had some things that Jesus said, hey, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm teaching you these things. You're close to me, but yeah, don't tell people who I am right now because you are really, not, you don't have my mind yet. And then, and then it comes out. 
And Peter didn't have his mind. He didn't have the mindset of Christ. And I think what happens is somebody says something that we agree with. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but we agree with it. There's a reason we agree with it. That's essential. Oh, yeah, that's good. And they're enticed to do it this way. Hey, that, that sounds really good. You know what? I like what so-and-so says because they, they're saying what I really feel, what I really believe. Yeah, they're, they're similar in the vein of your enticement. You know what? I'm going to go after that cheese because, you know what? They think going after that cheese is worth it. Well, what does God think? Well, I mean, why would he not want me to have that? Why don't you ask him? I mean, so many things can line up. Steward what you listen to, church. Now, steward how you react, how you respond. You're an ambassador, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Everything you have is in that context, that mindset, or it should be. You will never have the understanding you need on stewardship from a secular mindset. You'll never have it. You'll never have what God is doing spiritually from a world's point of view. It only comes from the mind of Christ, which is found in the Word of God. Where are you making room for Him, and where do you need to make room for Him? You know, the mind of Christ will draw you to His ways, and His ways are not our ways. The Bible says His ways are not our ways. What an amazing word we just heard. Click here for video announcements and click here to subscribe and stay connected with Crosswalk Online.